be seated. The battle for perspective does really matter, and it is an everyday challenge, and particularly a, a challenge for those of us who identify as disciples and followers of Jesus. We see this battle going on throughout the New Testament. The words of the authors of the New Testament are often just calling the people of God to see into reality. In fact, this is the whole book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is about seeing and about do we see what's really going on, especially when we're living in the midst of a challenging and difficult world. And we definitely need perspective. This has been a long week for a lot of reasons. It was hard to watch what unfolded in Uvalde, Texas, just after, about 10 days after what happened in Buffalo. And this week was also the two-year anniversary of George Floyd's killing in Minneapolis. We continue to watch the ongoing devastation in Ukraine. I think we become somewhat desensitized to it after this long and seeing so many images in the media. Also this last week, the church in Boston lost one of our greats, one of the men who was anointed by God and being used by God in powerful ways in the city, Roberto Miranda, Dr. Roberto Miranda of Line of Judah, Congregation Line of Judah in the South End died of a heart attack last Saturday night, and I joined, I, I would get, I don't know how many, 1,500 or more, including the mayor on Friday night in a funeral, just giving thanks for his life and remembering his ministry. And so it's been a heavy week, even in Boston, in the church here. And then there are just the personal matters of grief and sorrow. Uh, my wife's mom passed away uh, this Wednesday after decades of illness and physical challenges, and so we've been grieving that. She went to the end with uh, nonetheless, all the physical challenges, a sense of great joy and good cheer, and uh, our family will miss her deeply. I know I'm not alone in losing uh, a mother-in-law or a parent this week. Uh, Julie Halverson's mom went to be with the Lord earlier this week. Tracy Noga's father, Phil Mel's dad, did several weeks ago, and there are probably many others that I'm, I'm not even aware of. And then there are other issues, I'm sure, as I look out over this room and recognize we all are living in this broken world, and there are, there are all kinds of matters, some of which may, very, may be very heavy on your heart as you come in to worship today. Things that you're wrestling with perhaps in a relationship or in your family or with an aging parent or a rebellious child or a struggling marriage. There are a lot of reasons that we can easily begin to lose our perspective. We desperately need to remember who we are, where we are, the nature of the one to whom we belong don't we? And Paul, as we continue in this series in his letter to the church in Colossae, this is our third message in this series, Paul is continuing to anchor his prayer for the church there of, of giving thanks. In verse 12, he urges them to give thanks to the Father. And he's grounded that call for thanksgiving in what God has already done in Christ in verses 12, 13, and 14, as we looked at last week. And then he now moves in verse 15 to consider the nature of this one whose kingdom we have been transferred into. You see in verse 13 that he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I should I encourage you to open up your Bible to Colossians chapter 1 with me this morning. We'll be in verses 15 through 23, but um, we've been transferred to the kingdom of God's beloved son. And the question is, so who is this son? into whose kingdom we have been transferred. And that's where Paul turns in this next section as he transitions from prose to poetry and he contemplates the magnitude of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not some tribal deity who at best is just a figment of our imagination or at worst is the manifestation of dark powers that oppose and enslave humanity. He is not some obscure king over an obscure people. Rather, as Paul will declare here in words that can only lead to doxology, to praise, he is the Lord over all. The Lord over all. And Paul longs for the church to see this and to have a proper perspective. So the key question that he's asking is, who is this Jesus to whom we've entrusted our lives and to whom we've given our allegiance and what has God accomplished in him? Who is this Jesus? Attempts to wrestle with and answer that question throughout the 
2,000 years of the church's history are what we call Christology, the study of Christ. And that sometimes can feel maybe like a heady reality, but in fact, Paul is writing a letter to a young church in Colossae, longing for them to grow to maturity in Jesus, and he gets deep with them here about the person of Jesus as a necessary reality for them to grow to maturity. So this is an eminently practical reality, the study of Christ. is practical for us. It matters to us as we seek to grow to maturity. And this is one of the central texts in the New Testament on the person of Jesus. So as we look at it together, there are two basic points that we want to make, and then a third, really, uh, in verses 21 to 23. But Paul makes this case that Jesus is the Lord over creation, that he's the Lord of the new creation, and then thirdly, that we have been taken up into his work in verses 21 to 23. And before diving in, just to say, Paul is re-articulating the Jewish hope in this him, this poetry here. The Jewish hope was that the creator God who made everything that we see would also be the redeeming God, the one who would come and make all things new, that he wouldn't give up on his creation, but he would step in and renew it and bring it to its full completion and tell us in him. Paul is basically articulating that same basic hope that the creator God is also the redeemer God, but he's infusing it with Jesus, as we'll see. Jesus as the agent of creation and the agent of redemption. So first, verses 15 through 17, to help us get perspective, they articulate the fact that this beloved son is the Lord over creation. Let's just read these verses again. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The first thing Paul says is that this Jesus, and let's just remember how astonishing what he's about to say is. Jesus was a human being. He was a man. He walked and lived among people like you and me. He died on a cross, and then he rose from the dead. And Paul says he, in the Greek it's who, the relative pronoun, who is the image of the invisible God. The Son has been the perfect reflection of the heart and character of the Father from all eternity. And he is the true and reliable representation of God to us. There are echoes, of course, of Adam here, because the referent in verse 15 is the incarnate Christ, who is now ascended to the Father's right hand. But there's, refer there's echoes of Adam, Adam who was created in the image of God, of humanity who was created in the image of God, but did not faithfully represent God in the world, but rather fell into rebellion and sin and marred our ability to bear witness to God. Jesus, though, is different. Not just created in the image of God, but we're told here is the image of the invisible God. In the words of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Or in the words of the gospel according to John in the prologue, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. What Paul is saying from the outset in this poetry is that this Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible God. Then he says he's the firstborn of all creation. And the idea of firstborn here is one of rank in both, or uh, of priority in both time and rank. The Son pre-exists all creation, precedes all that is in the created order. And when this eternal one, the Son, became man in his incarnation, this is both the culmination of creation and the inaugural event of the new creation, as we'll see in a moment. The firstborn connotes highest rank. Psalm 89, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. That's about David. David, we all know, wasn't actually the firstborn. He was seventh or eighth in line in his family. But God says, I will make him the firstborn. I'll place him in the highest place. Sometimes people want to read the firstborn of all creation to say, look, therefore, Jesus is actually a creature, not the creator. And uh, I would say that to, to answer that, we would just go to verse 16, where we read that, 
Jesus was God's agent in creation and therefore is separate and over and above the created order and differentiated from it. So that's where we go next to verse 16. Paul says that, and, and he does this with three prepositions, in, through, and for. It's translated by in the ESV, although there's a footnote there that it could also be in, which is my preference. But Jesus is God's agent in creation. For by him or in him, all things were created. Christ is not the lone agent in creation, but creation is the work of the triune God, and Christ is God's intermediary, his agent in the work of creation. All things in him were created. Creation is carried out in the sphere, if you will, of Christ. And then we get through him at the end of this verse. All things were created through him. The instrumental work of Christ in creation. Christ as the agent. And here we get echoes of wisdom in the Jewish understanding. We think of Proverbs 8, 22, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. And then the creation happens with wisdom at the Father's side, the artisan at his side. Christ, in whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Paul will go on to say in chapter 2, is the agent through which creation occurs. And then we get for him. So we had in, through, and for which is to say that creation is to him. It is to be completed and summed up and brought forth in him for his glory and his honor. There's a telos or a goal of all creation to Christ. And when we use the word all, we mean all, the totality. It's used twice in verse 16. All things in the beginning were created and at the end of the verse, all things were created. Paul, Paul can't get any more clear that this is the totality. Everything that you see, from houseflies to hummingbirds to waterfalls to mountains to oceans to the sun and the stars, all things in, through, and for Christ. It's an astonishing vision about the scope and magnitude of this Lord. And then he finishes this reflection on the Lord of creation in verse 17. And he is before all things, again, about priority and time and rank. And in him, all things hold together. Everything owes its ongoing existence to him. Here we think about the doctrine of, of uh, God's preservation of the world, which is a part of the doctrine of creation. And what Paul is saying is this is going on in and through the agency of Jesus, that at the, begin, at the center of the cosmos is a deeply personal reality who is Christ, in whom everything holds together. Every cell, every atom, this world is literally held up by this Jesus. Back to Hebrews 1, verse 3, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So here is this picture of Christ, the Lord of creation, creating, sustaining, preserving, holding. It raises questions about his identity, doesn't it? This one who is the image of the invisible God. We'll read in verse 19, the one in whom the fullness of deity or the full, all the fullness was pleased to dwell. We'll read about in, in verse 9 of, of chapter 2 that in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The earliest Christians understood that Christ, this one who had walked among them, shared in some mysterious way in the divine identity. They were radically committed monotheists. God is one, and yet they understood Christ because of his death and resurrection to now uh, have a rightful place from all eternity in the identity of the one true God. They held on to their convictions that God is one, but they understood stood him as one God in three persons. And Christ shares in the divine identity with the Father shares in the creation work of the Father, in him, through him, and for him. On Thursday, we celebrated Ascension Day in the Christian calendar. And this is actually often really overlooked. You know, we think of Easter and Christmas, but Ascension, it, it, unfortunately, it gets kind of like the leftovers. It never happens on a Sunday. It's always 10 days before Pentecost. It always happens on a Thursday. But Ascension Day is the day that we remember after his resurrection, 40 days later, Jesus ascended, as we read about in Acts chapter 1, into the heavenly realm, to the throne room, to take his seat on the throne at the right hand of the Father, from which he would rule and reign over all of creation, to receive rightfully our worship and praise and our obedience and our offering of ourselves to him. 
And from that place, the Spirit would descend and be sent from the Father and the Son as we celebrate next Sunday on Pentecost. And that ongoing work of the expansion of his kingdom will go on through this ascended king. This is what we celebrate. This king has lordship over creation. And let me just point you to the, to the life and ministry of Jesus for a moment to illustrate this. But remember what Jesus does when he's on earth? Especially remember that time when he was in the boat with his disciples and there was a big storm and the wind and the waves arose and they came to him and they were concerned, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And he did what? Remember, he rebuked the wind and the waves. And in Matthew chapter 8, their response is, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Well, Paul tells us here in Colossians 1, he is the one over all creation. The Lord over creation. Creation does his bidding. And we see that in his miracles as well. In miracles of provision as he multiplies the elements of creation. In miracles of healing as he restores the broken dimensions of our bodies in creation. In the miracle or in the work of exorcism as he uh, casts out the powers of darkness that destroy creation. He is Lord over creation. Well then Paul turns in verse 18 to continue in this poetry with a reflection on Jesus is the Lord over the new creation. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him everything, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Athanasius, the church father in the fourth century, writing about the incarnation of Jesus, wrote these words. He said, the renewal of creation has been wrought by the self-same word who made it in the beginning. There is thus no inconsistency between creation and salvation, or what I might call new creation. For the one father has employed the same agent for both works, effecting the salvation of the world through the same word who made it in the beginning. There's a beautiful symmetry, isn't there? The God of creation uses the agent of the word in creation. The God of creation uses the agent of the word in his work of new creation. And that's what this hymn shows us, that he is Lord over creation and Lord over new creation. And Paul begins by saying, he's the head of the body, the church. Head meaning in the sense of power and authority or the source of the life of the body. Jesus is the sovereign ruler over all things, yes, but in particular in this time in between the times when we're awaiting the consummation of the kingdom, he is the head over the church. The group of people who have responded to him in repentance and faith and come under his sovereign rule. What Paul is saying to this little group of people in Colossae in the ancient Roman Empire is that in you, the new humanity, the new creation work is being brought to be in this world. God is restoring his creation under the headship and lordship of his son, Jesus. And then he says he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And let me just say that this word beginning seems to put a fixed point in a world where so much can seem illusory, something that we can sink our lives into and build our lives upon, the fact that Jesus is the beginning. Yesterday, I was able to attend the MIT commencement uh, for the class of 2020 and 2021. Yes, it's 2022, but COVID interrupted. And my nephew graduated from there in 2020, so we were there. And their uh, keynote speaker was uh, a poet from Hawaii, also an alum of MIT from 1999. I don't think MIT has too many poets in its alum, uh, alumni. Kealoa is his name, and he was spectacular. He did this amazing speech of what I would just call performance art. It was a poem with hand motions, very talented. But as I listened to him riff on nature and the world, he basically spoke about the cosmos as just a soup of neutrons, electrons, and protons that started with the Big Bang and the, the universe is kind of great self-expression and will end one day when the sun bursts in its death explosion and kills all known life. And he, he was so insightful and honest about the human condition. He said, for example, nobody will remember who you are 200 years from now, even though we're all trying to make our mark. He said, we'll all die. He talked about the most significant things in your life are the people around you and the relationships that you have. I heard Jesus on his lips so many times, but the name never came up. It was so untethered because it was just part of this, this cos cosmological soup. And he said, we're all essentially ancestors in training. 
because we will just become someone else's ancestors one day who have an impact on the world. There was for him no fixed point, though I heard in his heart a deep longing for Christ and a longing for the kind of certainty and meaning that Christ would bring. He encouraged and exhorted the graduates to be kind and to do things that were good. And I wondered what is the basis of his desire for morality other than the imprint of God's nature upon his own soul that he could not acknowledge except in the form of aliens that he said we didn't know if they were there or not. Christ is the beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the Lord over creation, and then he is the Lord over the new creation, the firstborn from the dead. So this is this oddity of the incarnation. Christ is over creation, but somehow he is also a part of creation, the firstborn from the dead. The leader, the one who passed through death and came out the other side, The firstborn implies there will be more to be born after him, that this great resurrection which the Jews longed for at the end of time, the Christians said, no, it's happened now. It's happened in the present. It's happened to one man, and it's happening to his followers spiritually and will one day happen to us all physically. And that was what they celebrated. And Paul is saying, this Jesus is the beginning of the new creation life, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he's lord over the creation he's lord over the new creation he might be preeminent he might receive glory and honor and praise it's all for him even if we don't recognize it it's all for him to exalt him above everything else and this one who is preeminent amazingly the one verse 19 in whom in him all the fullness of god was pleased to dwell where did the fullness of god dwell if you were the jewish people In the temple, remember? The temple was the meeting place of heaven and earth. It was where God and this world intersected and interacted. And what Paul is saying here in verse 19 is that now that temple is the body of the living Jesus. That it's in him that divinity and humanity, that creature and creator are united in his person. And there the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I mean, think about the exalted nature of Jesus in this hymn, and then you realize, oh, wow, this exalted one over all creation, he was the one, the agent through whom the Father chose to work to bring about the reconciliation. And notice the parallel here, all things in verse 20. Through whom the Father would reconcile to himself, to the Father, through Jesus, all things. Whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This preeminent Lord entered into the deepest of suffering. Was crucified on your behalf and mine. So that we might be reconciled to the God of life. There is in this hymn about the nature and person of Christ, there is embedded within it a deep understanding of the good news that God the creator is God the redeemer and the agent of his son and that he's reconciling all things. All of that craziness out in the world, all of that craziness in our lives, all of the disjointedness and the brokenness And the animosity and the unforgiveness, all of those things, God is working in Christ to bring reconciliation. All of the powers and authorities, I kind of skipped over that in verse 16, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all of these are created by Christ, for Christ. And he is working to reconcile them all to his Father. And this happens through the cross. Jesus is Lord over creation, and he is Lord by right. And in his incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, he becomes by fact and reality what he is by right. He becomes Lord of the new creation and Lord over all. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses among them. This is God's great work. 
to reconcile. I had the privilege 13 months ago of interviewing Dr. Roberto Miranda uh, for the Park Street Dialogues podcast. And we had a, a wonderful conversation. We re-released it this week and I would encourage you, if you didn't know this man, to listen to it. But he, again, was just a courageous and bold leader, humble and generous and compassionate, just who I wanna be when I grow up one day. I looked up to him as a father in the faith, as did so many in our city. And he told me the story in that interview of a dream that he had in 1993 that led to the church moving from Cambridge into the city of Boston. And he described the dream like this. He said he saw slowly gliding over the skyline of Boston a swarm of giant tarantulas large enough to be like airplanes. Silently, they slid over and settled over the skyline of the city. He said they were intelligent and had eyes full of poison and venom, bursting with poison, their skin was shiny. They were exercising influence in the city by settling over it and hovering over it. He saw them as demonic entities. And then he says in the left side of his vision in the dream, high above the tarantulas was the face of a lion looking down over the scene serenely over it. What impacted Roberto about the lion in the dream was the eyes. They were very sure of themselves, he said, very confident, full of power, more human than animal. And he said, just by looking down on this scene, the lion was exercising ultimate control and ultimate authority. He had a sovereign understanding of why this was happening and what its ultimate end would be. The lion was just managing it by looking at it. And then Roberto says, from where he was standing in the dream at a lower level and looking in the distance to this, he says, I pointed to the lion in the dream on the left-hand side of my vision and said in Spanish three times, tu eres el señor. Tu eres el Señor, tu eres el Señor. You are the Lord. You are the Lord. You are the Lord. That is the vision that Paul gives to his people in the church in Colossae. He is the Lord over all. Whatever the dark tarantulas are that are kind of hovering over the city of Boston. That led Roberto to lead the church to, 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 the, to the south end. And for the last 30 years, that congregation has a, had a tremendous impact on this city for the name of Jesus. And we praise God for their partnership in the gospel. But whatever the darkness is that's hovering over your life right now, I wonder, can you catch that vision of the lion? Of course, that led to the name of the church congregation, Lion of Judah. The lion that is ruling over creation and new creation and then paul finishes we'll finish just with a brief gloss here on verses 21 to 23 because he says look what god is doing in christ the lord over creation and the lord over the new creation he has done in your life and this is where it just gets mind-blowing to think about God is doing this amazing work in all the world but he's done it in your life and you verse 21 look with me at this text you who were once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. You were part of the tarantulas. You were under the darkness. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death that is making peace by the blood of the cross from verse 20. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This great work of reconciliation, Paul is saying to this little group in Colossae, it's happened to you. He's done it to you. He's reconciled you. You were in darkness, but you've been transferred, delivered and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son of this king. Now under the line of Judah, that's where you belong. And he longs to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. He longs to continue to work out his purposes for righteousness and life and wholeness, which we would call holiness in your life. And Paul's urging them and exhorting them then. You catch, did you catch those three words? Stable and steadfast, not shifting. Stay seated here, stay rooted here, stay grounded here under this cosmic king. And grow into this new creation people that you've been called to be. This passage is one of the best shots in the arm for our imagination. So if you've walked in today and your perspective of God 
is diminished and small. Perhaps because of the things that are going on in the world. May this hymn, this poetry, cause you again to see the glory and wonder and preeminence and sovereignty and supremacy of Jesus. In whom, through whom, and for whom all things were made. Of Jesus, the firstborn from the dead. Of Jesus, the one who is reconciling all things to the Father. Everything that you see out there finds its telos, its goal, its end in bringing glory to Jesus. This one who is the image of the invisible God. Let's pray. We praise and honor and worship you, Lord Jesus. And we simply ask that you would enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to leave this place in worship and praise of you, giving thanks to you. And to continue in this way of faith, stable, steadfast, and not shifting. Though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, you, God, are our refuge in times of trouble. You are Lord of all, and we worship you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.